Just want to make sure everybody can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. Good. Welcome everyone to another RealTO Community Show. My name is Chris Detzel. I'm the director of uh, customer community and engagement. It's a long title now, so I just have to try to remember that. Today joining me is our founder and CTO here at RealTO, Manish Sood. Manish, thanks again for coming. Um, and Anch Kanwar, and his title is pretty long, but I love it. It's VP of Core Data Platform and Infrastructure. Did I get that right, Anch? You got it perfect. It's a bit better than I did. <laughs> Great. So before we get started, we do have a few events coming up. Uh, today's event on Ask Me Anything with Manish. He's our founder and CTO. I am super excited about this. Thank you, everyone, that actually pushed out some questions into um, on the community. I will be push, pushing out a link here shortly for you to ask additional questions. My promise to you is that because we do have a ton of questions to get to from you, is that if we don't get them Today, I will have either Manish or somebody from RELTIO answer those questions uh, so that we get some of those uh, uh, answers to you as quickly as possible. Next week, we do have a show coming up on a deep dive into RELTIO cleansers. You asked for it, you got it. So uh, we had a kind of a, a just an overview of the cleansers um, and you guys want to go deeper. So we have that. Additionally, and something somewhat new is our RELTIO um, uh, CCAB, it's our content cab for our documentation. We have uh, uh, Megan and Mel uh, that kind of run that. If you want to be a part of that, shoot me an email directly um, and, and I can help you uh, be part of that cab. It's, these folks really just look at our content specifically around our documentation site on how to get, get it better. And it's a group of 10 or 11 people. And lastly, we have our um, upcoming Empire Life business benefits of RELTIO MDM platform, that they'll be talking about their roadmap, their implementation, what, what they're looking for in the future. Uh, and so we're certainly excited with Empire Life doing that. So fun part of today is we're going to have a little bit of swag. Let me put on my hat. So I won't put it on because I have a headphone, but we are giving away for those people that have asked questions on uh, the RELTIO community, and it's not too late to get your hat and or shirt um, if you post a question. I will push that into the chat for you to ask the question uh, on the community. I'm not saying you won't get any if you put it in the Q&A, but it's easier for me on the chat so I know exactly who asked the question from there. So it looks like Alex Pelt has like four people. But anyways, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to hand this over to Anch. No pressure, Anch, but uh, let's ask some good questions. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, hi, everybody. By way of introduction, uh, I'm Anch Kenmore. Uh, I've been with Rautio now for just over seven months, um, and I have about 20 years of experience um, in different SaaS companies, uh, Prior at Citrix Systems, I was at Lobby Inn uh, for a few years, um, and I joined Rautio as uh, the, the head of product management for the platform, and I also have responsibilities on the infrastructure side. Um, I am. I want to begin by thanking Manish really for being an amazing mentor, and he's um, he, he all every educate uh, sorry every conversation I've had with him over the last few months, it's been extremely educational. And he's, he's sitting right across the table from me. So when I look up, I'm actually looking at him. Um, and uh, it, it just gives me immense pleasure to be able to ask uh, uh, questions that, that you all have submitted and I'll intersperse with some questions. I, I may sneak in questions of my own. Um, so um, I also wanted to thank everybody who submitted questions uh, before this session. And we'll start there, but as you submit more, we'll leave more questions in. Um, all right, so with that, um, first, Manish, I really want to start with you. Manish, the person, the entrepreneur, um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and really tell us about this amazing journey at Traltio that you've been on. Well, Ansh, uh, first of all, thank you to you, uh, you know, for leading this discussion and uh, also, thanks to all the customers and partners who submitted the questions. Uh, 
you know, some really interesting uh, opportunity for a dialogue uh, for all of us. Um, to, you know, to go back to your question about, uh, you know, some of the motivation and thinking uh, behind RELTU and how we got started on the journey. Uh, you know, I, I can't really answer that question without going into a little bit of the history. Um, so I started RELTU in 2011. And uh, when I started RELTU, uh, some of the directional things that were becoming very clear and evident, one was uh, you know, the number of app applications that continue to grow and pr proliferate in the enterprise landscape. Um, and it was very clear even back in 2011 that uh, that pace was not going to slow down. There was going to be an increasing number of applications that were going to get created. The second one was uh, this need for digital transformation. Every company, and especially in the last 24 months, we have seen due to the pandemic that every company has to have a digital orientation for their business. Without that, it's a question of you know, survivability. It's not even growth, it's survivability. And uh, the third piece that was uh, in the early stages, the whole notion of cloud adoption. And again, in 2011, there was only one cloud provider, AWS. At that point in time, uh, it was starting to become clear that if you have to manage data, first of all, it will continue to grow. So you need systems that can scale horizontally or can continue to add more data. And by the way, the best place to build those kinds of systems would be the cloud, right? And because the compute and storage and all those types of lower level infrastructure capabilities were becoming available. So the question in front of us was that having seen some of the past experience and hurdles with adoption of MDM type of concepts, um, my fundamental belief has always been that MDM is the right concept that was a little too early for its time. And it didn't have the right underlying technology capabilities to support a customer's journey. Because some of the problems that we solve in MDM or think of it as a concept where you have to bring together data from multiple sources, unify it and stitch it together into a holistic answer. Those types of requirements always will have an increasing number of systems that you will need to tackle. Yes. Will always present you with the challenge that you, if you don't know what are all the systems that you will have to integrate, how can you possibly know what schema will those systems have? And yet people were trying to define a singular data model that was fixed as a relational construct in the middle of that as the way to integrate. I don't know if I will encounter a record for a customer that has one email address or five email addresses. So why am I defining a data model that has a one-to-one -one cardinality for a person to have an email address? I'm just using that as an example. But those types of issues were at the crux of why some of the previous generation type of capabilities failed or ran into problems because the method of solving those problems was not in line with the nature of the problem itself. Right. So, you know, long story short, um, the motivation at that point in time was that there is a big problem that is only getting bigger and there is an opportunity to build a system from the ground up that can scale to meet that need that customers are going to encounter. And by the way, um, if you think about the enterprise, everybody has business process automation, everybody has refined how they use applications at scale across the enterprise. But the biggest hurdle for every business today is the number of siloed applications or data silos that they have, and that becomes the friction point for their business. So the next optimization or the wave of optimization that everybody needs to think about 
is going to be how to have data as a continuum while they continue to drive evolution of their business. Because the data that you have today is going to help drive the decisions that you're going to make tomorrow. So creating a capability that would support the businesses for the next you know, 15, 20 plus year, year type for time horizon was uh, the opportunity that we saw. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't shake that out of my head. And I had to go work on that problem. And the answer to that was creating RELQ as the vehicle to go solve that problem. So long answer to your question, but that was uh, sort of the thought process that I went through. And, and um, coming in at this point, I see the full realization of that thought in the amount of flexibility that we offer in the platform and the sheer number of different, the variety of problems that our customers solve using our platform. So um, I, but, but seeing that 10 years ago, that's, that's amazing. Um, uh, I also wanted to thank Sumit Kalyanpuri for that question and for getting us started. Thank you. Um, next is from Abi Husseini at Mercury, and um, this is a this is this is sort of a system wide question, really, which is how does data governance and MDM how do they interplay? How do they work together? Um, this is, is does MDM exist to solve the clear you know lack of clear data governance? Or once you have good data governance, you no longer need MDM. Can you help us understand the interplay there? That's a great question. And uh, you know, having uh, lived through various evolutions of MDM and data governance as a uh, you know overarching concept, my uh, take on this is that it is an ever evolving continuum where these two things have to go hand in hand because. You know, think about it uh, as an example, data quality. What is good enough, right? If you, let's, let's say if you have the ability to claim that you have reached 70% as the milestone in improving data quality, does that mean your work with data quality is over? Or does that mean that you can go ahead and now tackle the remaining 30%? Or you know, instead of tackling all of the 30%, you will say, I have to improve it from 70 to 75, 75 to 78. And you keep making incremental progress because in these areas, there is a long tail of opportunity Mm -hmm. and uh, effort that is involved with it. So what is the best way of solving for these things in concert? I think this is where certain principles have to be thought through where how does master data management aid data governance and how does data governance aid master data management? Mm -hmm. Because both of them have to go hand in hand. And as we uh, bring together, aggregate and unify information, we have to think about, is there a different governance model that we can apply to it? Because, you know, instead of being, being fragmented, siloed, data spread across all different systems. Even if you put a system of governance and a system of curation in place, which is the master data management system, then you have to think about how the data governance policies will drive the continuous improvement on top of it. And instead of having data governance spread out into different parts of the organization, Can you do it in a manner where you are empowering more people to participate in that data governance cycle? So essentially, taking it from a small number of people to democratizing data governance where, you know, if if we are working with the business on a specific, let's say, customer, Mm -hmm. can we contribute and make the quality of that customer record better? Um, our belief, and this is why we created the UI capabilities, which uh, you know a lot of customers give us feedback on how differentiated or um, you know good the UI capabilities are. But our goal has been that we have to put data into hands of more users, mm-hmm. 
because the more eyeballs that can be on the data right. and more hands on keyboards that can be aiding and assisting in the work with the data, the better the quality and the governance of that data gets. Right. Otherwise, it's in some dark room or black box and nobody has a good understanding of what the governance policies and practices are. Right. But by bringing more users with the data together, it drives to a better outcome. That makes sense, and and the full expression really of of a, uh, of, of a solution like Reltio is not just bringing all of that data in and mastering it, but really also then unleashing it and making it available for every department or sort of these distributed data ownership models, where all of this curation could happen in that distributed manner. Also, right. curation at the edge, right, right, right. Just like you have computing on the edge, you have to go to curation at the edge. And again, more participants and more users of the data right. drives better quality. Right. If it's hidden from everybody else, then you're most likely not going to see success with your program. Yep. No, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's an add-on question here from Jay Prakash, and that has to do with best practices. Um, any data governance frameworks uh, that we've seen uh, working across various clients and their feedback? So there have been different models of data governance, uh, you know, that uh, different customers have adopted. Um, and a lot of the customers started with the highly centralized data governance type of a model. Uh, it worked in very controlled environments. Uh, but what we are seeing is that even those customers are now trending towards enrolling a more distributed type of governance model. The challenge previously was, that their systems were fragmented and hence they could not go to a more distributed system of governance. But now by centralizing the data, they are able to distribute the governance of that information right. into a single data repository. So, um, you know, there is, they may, they may seem like opposing constructs, but unifying and centralizing the data right but distributing the governance right. is the model we see evolving that more and more customers are adopting and finding success with. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, since you mentioned data quality, I want to pick up a question, another one from Abby, but I know that there's a whole theme here around data quality and the questions we've received. Um, and that goes, how should organizations fundamentally solve the data quality issues that emanate from poor source system data entry problems? It's a pretty specific yeah. question, but in general, all, all hosts of issues around data quality as they're streaming into um, our, our systems of record. Um, can you help us sort of think through that? Uh, I, I like to call it the method to the madness. <laughs> Um, there is a sequence to approaching it. Um, you know, for example, let's think about the state where you don't have a master data management or a central, you know, 360 degree view of the information that you're working with. In that case, all of the data is getting created in the applications. And a lot of the consumption of that data is taking place in those applications. And most of those applications don't have good data quality type of capabilities or ability to prevent duplicates from getting created even within those applications. So, you know, instead of trying to rewire each system on day one, uh, I think uh, the sequence that works or has proven to work is start centralizing the information because instead of going across 50 different applications and trying to manage quality in each one of them, separately, you have to get to a shared understanding of the data quality. And you put a system um, for this in place, which is unifying, aggregating, or aggregating and unifying the information like an MPM system. You get more eyeballs on that data because then you can understand not only the source level contribution, but you can also understand what is the aggregate impact on that information. And then you have to go back to the source systems to inform them where their processes are lacking. For example, 
now that you have a central repository in place, should you empower these source systems or applications with a search before create type of capability so that they can look up records in the central repository and then onboard from there versus having to fat finger in or key in something erroneous every time. Right. Right. More so of the same information. More of the same information. So you try to reduce the, the, you know, the quality issues at the edge, but it's a round trip that you have to go through. Right. So the sequence is don't try to solve it in all the peripheral applications. Centralize that information, get better insights of where you stand on the data quality paradigm. Right. And then with that centralized information, power the experiences so that you can control the creation points mm -hmm. in a manner where it is reducing the noise at those edges. Right. right. So the observability gets centralized and then very actionable metrics can get pushed out to the edges. Actionable metrics as well as actionable tangible capabilities that can be tied into those applications. That makes sense. Um, let's move a little bit beyond, but not too far beyond data quality. And, and really, um, this is about the effort required to, to delve into data quality. But really, this is from Lorik Tordo at Schneider. And, and he's asking a general question about match and merge decisions. Um, you know, all of these activities still take a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of manual operating to get right. Uh, and this question is, what is our strategy? What is relative strategy to help move towards more automation or greater efficiency? Um, that's that's a great question. If you think about any of the deployments, and it doesn't really matter if it's a um, relative deployment or any other flavor of master data management capabilities that customers have been using. Loic is absolutely right that there is a lot of manual effort, even after the data has been ingested after it has been matched and merged because you still have to resolve some of the manual matches or you have to steward some of the changes to the data um, and there is a process or a set of processes that customers have to define as to even how to identify some of the gaps or anomalies in the data and then fix them can we automate those areas can we bring ML or AI type of algorithms that can assist in that process. And again, one of the reasons why we created the Relative Foundation in the manner that we did, that we have been long-term believers in the impact of AI and ML in this area. But in order to create a system where we could provide recommendations that would assist uh, our users, we had to build not just the framework which would allow us to create those capabilities but we also had to um, ingest in our system a reasonable amount of data from, from customers so that we could start training some of the models that would aid and assist those customers uh, or users and um, you know the great news is that we are now at a point where we are starting to double down on the uh, AI ML investment and a large part of the benefits that you will see out of it are things like detecting anomalies out of the data so that you don't have to go fish for those anomalies. The system can surface those anomalies, bring it to you. And then even suggesting what type of fixes can be applied because in some cases you will get a recommendation about you know, you should use an enrichment provider mm -hmm. that will fill a gap and give you completeness of information. Or in some cases, it's really something that was fat fingered and a minor correction will fix that data. So creating those, uh, you know, capabilities that would aid and assist the users, those are the types of directions that we are starting to invest in and uh, first step in that direction was uh, creating the capability of the data quality dashboards uh, that we have uh, been in the process of rolling out to the early adopters of the capability mm -hmm. and the next step from there is to start identifying some of the anomalies that the customers would be able to see from the application itself 
so that it reduces the amount of effort that they have to go through. And you will see continuous improvements in those areas. In fact, even in the area of matching and merging, the match IQ type of capabilities are not just for matching the data, but also for, you know, you have lots of manual matches that are sitting there in the queue to be processed by your data stewardship team. And there are not just thousands there. In some cases, there are hundreds of thousands of manual matches that have to be looked at. Um, in those scenarios, the assistance from the match IQ algorithms or models would help to double verify the results of the matching algorithm so that then the users can accept those results. So again, these are just some examples, but uh, you know, the team at Relteo is uh, very excited about the next set of capabilities that we'll be able to unleash uh, with the application of AI ML for the specific purpose. I, I, I will double down on that. I, I, I could not be more excited about the roadmap that we have for the rest of the year and cannot wait to talk to um, our customer community about, about those things. Um, I'll switch gears just a little bit and, and focus on the ecosystem for a second. A um, couple of questions will go in sequence. The first one is, what is the strategy to increase attract applications and services to make their data, those providers' data and applications available through integrations with Relative? Uh, great point. Uh, you know, integrations, it, going back to something that I just mentioned, which was we have to, Mastering is only 20% or less of the equation. Making data more usable across the varied application landscape, across every business process, across every uh, analytics and data science type of an outcome is the, is the big part of the equation and the big win. So one way to drive that is by making sure that the integration options are easier and faster for our customers. And there are different ways in which we are going about that process. One is, uh, if you look at the recent rollout of Relteo Integration Hub, um, the sole purpose of that was that before the release of Relteo Integration Hub, we had some API level capabilities, which are great for developers who understand APIs or we had some connectors or, um, you know, MuleSoft, SnapLogic um, type of uh, integration tool sets that are being used by customers. And you can simply use a Relteo connector for it. You can drag and drop different types of things. So again, making it easier. But now with Relteo Integration Hub, we want to bring the low code, no code type of flexibility into the mix so that we can have citizen developers developing integrations and taking data from Relteo to various applications or from various applications into Relteo so that you can have the closed loop of integration available to you. And if one developer, citizen developer creates that capability, they can share with the rest of the community so that you know every customer is helping solve the other customers problems as well. So we, we created that platform that we rolled out. But now we ourselves want to make use of that. And you know, in the past, we have had uh, third party enrichment uh, data providers that we have integrated with. Dun & Bradstreet was one. And in life sciences, we have had some sources that we put into the data tenant type of orientation. We just added Bureau Van Dyke for organization data to this mix, but we are creating a roadmap of different types of data domains and the different types of third-party data providers that we can have as pre-integrated capabilities. So different flavors of integration, some for enrichment, some for managing the entire life cycle of data mm -hmm. into Relteo and out of Relteo into applications and back and forth. But our goal is to create a holistic set of these integration capabilities that can be made available so that more and more of you can benefit from what already exists instead of having to go create something. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
actually. And we're seeing some really powerful use cases come out of that integration hub capability yeah. where our vision of really having non-developers be able to extend the platform um, every week, it seems like we have a new use case and a new story that, that we're able to share with our customers. Not only do we have a new use case or a new story mm -hmm. uh, that we will be able to share with different customers or you know, all of the customers, but the pace at which this is increasing. You know, that is tremendous because we are now, instead of spending three months, we are spending a couple of days and seeing a new example come to fruition. That's very good. Um, there is a specific question about DMB, but I think also speaks to the ecosystem. Uh, does Rautio have any plans to provide shareable data beyond DMB? I know you partly answered that, but maybe we could spend another minute. Yeah. So, you know, there are several third party data providers that are relevant for the person domain or the organization domain or the product domain. And uh, our product management team is now looking at uh, prioritizing some of those sources. In fact, we would really love to get feedback from our customers. What third party data sources are relevant to them? You know, for example, I think this question came from Loic, where he had uh, asked about uh, the third party data providers. Uh, you know, Bureau Van Dyke, as I had mentioned, was one. But uh, they had, uh, or uh, Loic had brought up uh, uh, a denied party screening process uh, because of the various sanctions, you know, the organizations that you do business with. And in fact, they're, Loic's team is helping us identify what are all the sources that they would like to see integrated. What are the integration methods and mechanisms that we could put into place? And uh, a large part of that is going to be informed by our customers. So we would love to get your suggestions or your requirements of which data sources are you prioritizing so that we can uh, you know, learn from it and uh, help you solve some of those problems. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I'd, I'd perhaps love to do a community webinar in which we talk about these these data sources, and we can share the candidates that we're thinking about and get feedback. That that them. would be great yeah. um, because I think once again, uh, customers and partners are the best source of uh, helping us understand that landscape and uh, really tell us about which sources are more relevant than others. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and take a question from Ashish Ravat here at Fresh Gravity. Uh, and he asked, how does Veltio, a, a SaaS product company, ensure customer, ensures customer with data security concerns or assures customers with data security concerns? Um, we are in the data management business. We are running a SaaS platform where um, all of our customers bring in their core critical business data into Reltio. And one of the parts of the responsibility that we have as a service provider to our customers is to ensure the security of that data. Um, there is a large investment at Reltio that goes into not only building up the compliance type of policies, but also investing in security technologies that surround the perimeter of our product capabilities. Uh, in fact, not just the perimeter, but they're uh, you know, an integral part of how we create the product, how we have engineering working on the code uh, that gets rolled out into different environments and uh, you know, all the checks that it goes through, in addition to how we secure the data itself. Um, so, Again, you know, that's a core part of our offering. In fact, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you know, we are happy to walk you through and your security audit teams through the details of what is being put into place, already in place, and what is the evolving roadmap uh, of those capabilities. But it is one of our biggest investment areas after the product capabilities to invest in. And uh, this is not only an investment theme, but also a significant differentiator for us 
because we become a part of your security infrastructure. We become an extension of that and we provide those capabilities on your behalf so that you don't have to go create that additional security capabilities around the data that you're managing inside Routy. Absolutely. Um, oh, there's yet another one that I'd like to pick up from Lloyd. Um, just such, such a great set of questions here. Um, and, and he is looking at CDPs, customer data platforms. Um, and his question is technology, it's this technology stack that allows, to, allows capturing of real time PII and non PII like cookies, IP addresses, et cetera. How does Routio position itself in this space? Are there plans to evolve the platform accordingly? Or are there capabilities today that customers can start using to solve some of these problems? Uh, it seems like uh, we have to sign up for another uh, webinar on this topic because uh, you know this is this is a very relevant and timely topic mm -hmm. um, for a couple of different reasons. One, the entire life cycle from anonymous to known PII type of information and how should you manage the life cycle of that data. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a concept of progressive stitching right. inside Reltio um, and. Uh, you know, if we take a step back and think about why we have created the Reltio capabilities to be available through an API, is you know, primarily for the purpose of being able to stitch that digital journey together. Mm -hmm. Because in every part of the digital journey, um, you know, when you go to a website, you're only a cookie because you haven't yet created your own profile by registering into the site. But that cookie with some of the minor details of the IP address, other types of details can be instantiated inside Reltio as an unknown profile. Mm -hmm. And as somebody goes through a conversion process and engages in that life cycle, at that point, that profile goes from an unknown profile to a known PII profile. But even at that stage, the amount of information available is no more than a cookie ID and an email address. But stitching together that information and then progressively building on top of it, because there will be multiple channels of interaction. You know, you go from registering as a user to actually buying a product. Once you buy a product, then you have to provide additional information. You will have to enter your address information for delivery. You will have to enter your name information or some of the additional details for contactability beyond email. And that adds more attribution to the profile. So there is this, this concept of progressive stitching where it's not necessarily data coming from 50 different sources on day one. Right. You start with a single source, you start with a few elements of the profile attribution, and then you keep adding more details to it. And yes, along the way, you also add more sources because as you get an email address, you have the ability to match it to other data sources inside your organization. As you get address and phone number information, you can then do more from a matching and unification point. So that's how we have been able to help some of our customers. And in fact, uh, you know, more and more customers, especially with the evolution of the CDP platforms are coming to us to better manage this type of profile information in a central place before sending it down into the various marketing uh, systems. Right. Right. And uh, you know something that uh, I think uh, uh, we should definitely uh, take Chris Detzel up on uh, organizing a webinar for. Yeah, and, and I, the, the workflow that you described, almost the, re, the retail workflow that you described, that's almost a perfect example of this, um, because even in that sequence, you may get login information as a prerequisite to, to purchasing something, certain yep. workflows, but in others, you may end up through the whole process, do the checkout, and at the payment point, you may enter your login or choose to enter a login. And so the sequencing of all this information it's um, it, 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 the flexibility that our progressive stitching provides 
that allows for different workflows to be created and not be dictated by absolutely the the workflows can be different but the progressive stitching concept is primarily that you will receive piecemeal information right. that you will keep adding more attribution details exactly yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, some of these things are very exciting for me to learn about <laughs> in all the capabilities that we can unlock um, Now this one is about performance, and this is from uh, Mercury Insurance. Um, and I, I really like the way it's phrased. It says, for Relto's vision to be ultimately game-changing, APIs need to be very high performing. How do you plan to make MDM data available to inline decision-making via APIs? Um, so, Ansh, uh, one of the things that uh, you, know, you and I discuss this very often as we talk about the roadmap and the future capabilities that we want to unlock. Um, day one, when we started Relteo, we said that this has to be an API enabled, API led paradigm, because more and more organizations, you know, at their own pace are moving towards uh, the time to action being reduced down to milliseconds. There was a time when companies would, you know, every company has had data for the longest period of time, but their ability to act on that data was seven days later or 30 days later because they would wait for all the data to flow into a data warehouse and then they would look at it, but most of it would be rear view mirror type of information because, you know, the engagement already happened, the transaction already happened. But as we talk to uh, most of our customers, they're all moving towards reducing that, that time to action and bringing it to the point of engagement. So if you're, I'll, I'll use the retail example because we are all familiar with it. We all go shop in store, online, all those types of things. But at the point of checkout or at the point of purchase, that is where the retailers are trying to enable action with the information. Mm -hmm. And this is where the real time nature of the APIs is extremely important. And not just real time, the ability to do it as a, I'll use a technical term, a synchronous response mm -hmm. where a request can get a response in less than 300 milliseconds or even you know, we have now customers who are saying 300 milliseconds is not good enough. Exactly. We want 100 milliseconds. Right. So our directional goal is to improve our core set of APIs. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean APIs that export data out of Relteo. Right. Everything in Relteo is an API, but there are a core set of APIs like the get a profile right. or search for a profile or, you know, update or insert a profile. These are real-time APIs that need a real-time response back. And that has to be down to milliseconds. And that's where we are making additional investments so that we can drive our orientation to be even faster than where we are today. And really help every organization be in that digital forefront where they're able to impact the experience that they're delivering. Doesn't matter if it's supplier that you're working with, consumer that you're engaging with, or a patient that you're trying to service, it has to be at the point of engagement. Right. right. And um, there, there's another aspect that I, I've seen bubble up over the last few months, which is um, constantly optimizing the implementation. Because over the years, we've introduced new APIs, things that we in the past could do through searches. Now yeah. we're able to do through um, straight lookups. Um, and so, you know, looking at the current usage pattern of the APIs, we've often been able to help customers speed up certain workflows. Right? Absolutely. Um, again, you know, going into the technology details, a get API call is always faster than a search API call. So, you know, if we see a certain pattern that comes up consistently through the use of search, we are saying, should it really be a part of the get type of an API call? 
and can we optimize the system to deliver better performance on it? Um, and that's where um, you know some of it is being informed by the customers' usage patterns and uh, how they are engaging with us, asking for better capabilities. Right. But at the same time, uh, our own internal desire to have our APIs perform better because we know that every customer has to get to that real-time orientation for the digital business that they run. Makes sense. Um, there is a direct question here from Deepa around support. Um, his perception is that we can improve uh, our support services, and he's asking, "What are the plans for that?" Great question. Um, you know, some of the feedback that we had received from our customers was uh, that uh, you know, 12 months ago or before that, our support needed a lot of improvement, and uh, you know, over the last couple of years, we have been investing heavily in not only adding more team members, but how we train them, how we make our support processes more robust, um, you know, what is the path to uh, resolving some of the issues and how quickly we respond to those customers. Uh, a large part of it is, uh, you know, us training and enabling our own resources uh, to be the trusted uh, uh, you know, extension of a customer's team, uh, understanding the contextual uh, relevance of the questions that are being raised by the customers. And uh, that awareness uh, allows us to lead to the responses in a faster, better manner. Um, and also, you know, constantly getting feedback from our customers because uh, a large part of this is informed by, we have made improvements in a certain area but Mr. Customer, what are the things that you're not yet seeing? And is it because you know, we haven't tackled those other parts of the support equation or is there something that we need to evolve in our support engagement structure that we have? So you know, once again, uh, you know, would love to get uh, Deepak's feedback on uh, uh, you know, where he sees some of the areas or opportunities for improvement that we can go after so that we can further improve it and enhance our support capabilities. Absolutely. Um, and uh, this may be yet another opportunity for perhaps a community webinar or an engagement where we can bring uh, Dan Crossell our- Absolutely, you know, just like, you know, for example, with the documentation, right. we have a lot of support from our customers and partners where they are providing advice to us as to how we should improve those capabilities and you know if our documentation improves our ability for our customers and partners to go do more with our system improves Absolutely. in a similar manner we would love to seek their guidance and advice on what other things we should be thinking about and maybe even having an advisory council around it that we can go after and uh, get some valuable data from that's almost a perfect segue into the next question I was going to ask. And this one is also from Deepak. He says, what is the plan to engage customer side decision makers with RELTIO? Specifically, he's asking about roadmaps, uh, QBRs for roadmaps, consultation on new partnerships. Uh, what, would the what are the mechanisms that we may be thinking about? So some of the mechanisms that we are thinking about, first of all, you know, uh, and again, these are different tools, but uh, I would uh, encourage all of our customers to use all of these tools. Uh, community. That is a great way to get uh, input back to Reltio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, for example, um, you have your standard engagement model where you're engaging as issues come up, you go to support, you open up tickets, you know, our engineering and product management teams review those types of details. But community is the, the vehicle where if you have something that is outside the bounds of a support ticket, then please provide that suggestion or discuss that uh, in the community so that we can uh, take that input and further inform our roadmap. On the customer success side, we are, uh, 
in the process of revamping our model where we can have a systematic process for engagement with the customers and their teams on roadmap discussions, on looking at, you know, Relti is a pretty uh, wide platform in terms of capabilities. And a lot of times what we find is some customers are only using a portion of those capabilities. Even though they have access to the other capabilities, they haven't gone down the path of adoption of those additional capabilities. So through that uh, you know, engagement where the CSM team can help the customers understand some of the opportunities for further adoption with what you already have access to, and also in return getting feedback on some of the roadmaps that you're thinking about because it's not just about the relative roadmap it's also about your roadmap for the next 12 to 18 or 24 months where if we get an understanding of that then we can look at you know how to incorporate some of those things into our product roadmap or provide guidance on how we should be jointly solving for some of the things that will not fit into a product orientation. So those are some of the vehicles for engagement. Uh, but Ansh, you know, uh, uh, you've been uh, leading the charge on this. So, you know, from a product management standpoint, any areas that stand out to you that would be additional vehicles for customers to engage? Yeah, um, definitely. I think three, uh, three avenues I can think of. Um, one is providing feedback just as far as ideas go, improvements to the product go. We have an ideas portal that we share all of our customers' ideas with other customers. So please go in, take a look, uh, work with either um, uh, your CSM or we're happy to put product management time into talking to you and really walking through some of those top ideas. And please add your votes, right? That's how we get the signal that there is demand from multiple customers and, and, and we use that every planning cycle to prioritize some of these requests. Um, the second area is around QBRs and um, we are making it a consistent practice to talk about a roadmap in those QBRs. The way to think about the roadmap going forward is the current release for us. So we have major releases three times a year. The current release is locked, but the next release, we really lock it with about 60% confidence. That means we leave room for these conversations and to be able to move things around to, to fit in what we learn from you as we're talking to you in those QBRs. Um, and, and of course, further out, um, the third release is about 20% confidence. So there's definitely a lot of fluidity there uh, for our customers to be able to influence that far out. And that's where really your comment about aligning roadmaps really comes in, into its own. If we know uh, where your large projects are going, then we can, we can definitely try our best to align with those. Um, the third area I, I, I wanted to uh, talk about are advisory councils. And so um, we are, I would say we're, we're growing up, we're maturing um, and creating subject specific advisory councils. Um, where we'd love your input on, for example, our, um, the way we have our UI set up and the usability. We're in the process of improving the UI and releasing a brand new version, which we feel is significantly more usable and cuts down on interaction time or time to task. And um, that's a very specific example, but it's just, just an example of how targeted we want these advisory councils to be. And by doing that, we're hoping that we ask you for very targeted input. It's efficient in terms of your time and it's efficient in terms of outcomes that we can drive to improve things. So th those are three avenues that, that I can think of. Um, but as always, we're open to ideas. Wherever you see we're not following best practices as a company, please tell us and we're, we're happy to open additional avenues. Uh, good job, Manish, in turning around the conversation. <laughs> Um, I, I, I want to uh, take, take a last question here, which is um, also from, from Abby, but um, it, it's, a, it's, it's about a vision and it's about where we're going as a company. Um, and he asks, if you fast forward five years, how do you see Valtio's vision and market presence? 
what will you be known for? So Reltio's uh, uh, mission is to be the real-time operating system for data. And when we say data, it is the core data that your business runs on. So think about customer information, product information, supplier information, uh, asset information, employee information. These are all the different types of data domains that are relevant to running your business. And given the fragmented state of the enterprise or the siloed state of the enterprise, there is a dire need to have central system that will govern, manage, aggregate, unify, and provide the single source of truth for these types of uh, data domains. And that's where we see Relcio playing because uh, my uh, long-term uh, hypothesis in the, you know, towards the evolution of this space is that applications will create data, consume data, but they will not be governors or owners of data. Applications will need data to be available in an equal manner across all the different parts of the business process at any given point in time as a real-time asset that they can tap into or contribute into. And that is going to come from the Reltio type of systems that will act as the, the data plane, uh, a real-time data plane or a real-time operating system for data. But uh, the business processes will contribute or consume information at any given point in time. Um, analytics will depend on data coming out of this. Uh, you know, data science will depend on it because uh, this is how the data will become the continuum of everything that we do in the enterprise. Wow, that's, that's a very expensive vision. Thank you, Manish. And um, I also thank everybody for being part of this webinar and, and really engaging questions. And as Chris uh, said, we'll follow up with any unanswered questions and make sure that they're published uh, um, on community. With that, Chris, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Anch, Manish, wow, this is really great. And somebody asked me, do you think you'll get an hour in? Yes, we did. <laughs> no problem. We didn't even get to all the questions. Um, so thank you for, um, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for your time. We do have two great community uh, shows coming up, and um, I continue to, to get more coming in. So uh, Anch and Manish already pr uh, promised you four more uh, from what I heard. <laughs> so uh, we'll definitely start thinking about how to book those and push those in. Um, by the way, here's the swag. You see my shirt and you see my uh, hat. Right now, we are out of medium shirts, but uh, we're getting some more in. Uh, we do have uh, some others coming up. So what I'm going to do is it's not too late to get your swag. Ask a question on the community uh, with the link that I just got you. So hopefully you like that or, yeah, that I just sent over. Um, Joseph, I haven't forgot about your questions. I'll get those posted on your behalf on the community. Um, and I've got the others there, too. So Thank you, everyone, for coming. This was really cool, really awesome. We'll do this again. Um, and you guys have a great day and keep the questions coming on the community. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.